Another episode, Gonzaga Nation SI, myself, Dan Dickow, alongside fellow Zag, Adam Morrison. Mo, a couple days in sunny California. Uh, before we get into talking about the dominant performance of LMU and then the get through the game of Pepperdine, uh, do you enjoy the sun? I did. It was nice to uh, get some sunshine. We obviously stay down in santa monica it's kind of a cool a cool hotel a bit different than we used to right on the beach um so thanks to coach few for upping his status as a, a head coach and being able to pull that off um so yeah it's been <laughs> nice uh it, there is a def definite difference in travel for gonzaga when we played as to what they get these days is there one hotel that you can think of that uh, you just shake your head at and say, I can't believe we stayed there all these years later. Uh, yeah. I mean, the I'm trying to think the Benson, even though it was, you know, historically famous and uh, Portland, um, it's just funny because everything's from like the 1940s. So the beds yeah. were like really small and the shower heads would come to here on everybody. So <laughs> that one was funny, but it was, it was, you know, it's an all time classic and it's still there. But uh, when you think back, you're like, that's not suited for a bunch of tall athletes. Yeah. I remember there was one uh, road trip that we made. It was it would have been my junior year. We were at Santa Clara. And obviously the difference, there's nothing wrong with a motel. But when you're traveling with a basketball team at the Division One level, you typically have a charter bus and you stay in a hotel. <laughs> we were in a motel <laughs> where literally we had people that not random people knocked on guys doors like coming in drunk that night not knowing what was going on and the next morning trying to like just hearing stories from different guys like man what was going on on outside in the parking lot and this was literally like eight, eight feet from the windows of 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 the rooms it, that was a unique trip that was for sure times have changed they have now now i mean, and they're staying at the, uh, you know, the nicest spots in town. I think part of what is kind of spurred that is, you know, when you're a one seed in the NCAA tournament, you get the nicest hotel in that city. And it goes all down the list to the 16 seed in that pod gets still a nice hotel, but it's nowhere near the amenities of the one seed. So I think that's spoiled Coach Few and staff a little bit. What would you say to that? Uh I agree, but I think the biggest thing for him, and this is, I'm pretty sure I'm right, is him doing uh, Team USA basketball and being around a bunch of professional coaches. And like when he does the Vegas uh, swing, you know, uh, he starts talking to him, hey, where do you guys stay at? And then he gets the idea, like, we should be staying there. So I think that's where it stems from. I'm not complaining about it. Obviously, the guys aren't. And a lot of times, too, it's convenience. It's not just, you know, it's a quote unquote nicer hotel. You know, you have to do multiple shoot arounds or multiple uh, film sessions. Sometimes those places don't have, you know, the banquet rooms or the halls yeah. and stuff like that. So, like, it's not just a, you know, uh, put your nose in the air type of thing. It's sometimes it's like, hey, if it costs us a little bit more and it makes it more efficient and we still win ball games and it's better for recruiting, it makes sense. Yeah, no, the good, good points there. That's for sure. Well, let's get to the basketball side of things down in, in the L.A. area. Um We'll touch on Pepperdine in a second, but that Loyola Marymount game, I don't think I've seen a better probably 17-minute stretch by any team in college basketball season. You know, they were down 5-4, and then next time you look up, I think it's like 32-10. to 10. Um, You know, what, what, what were your thoughts watching that transpire? Well, I was just really impressed with our defensive plan going into the game because there's something had to change in the ball screen coverage of Cam Shelton that was – you know, on my broadcast, I'm sure you guys talked about it on the CBS one, the TV side, was we have to guard them differently in their high ball screen package. We came out with a, a blitz or a red um, double team right away, and I thought that was the right thing to do, and I kind of set the tone um, yeah. defensively and allowed us to get out and run. And then, I mean, the start offensively was unbelievable. I think we went 13 of 15 to start the game. And the only miss was a, a Julian Strother who had a fantastic game and stretch missed a layup early. And then I think Drew missed a layup early Then every, everybody else obviously made shots. And it was just really demoralizing for um, LMU and that whole crowd. I mean, the buzz going into the gym was fantastic. Yeah. I haven't seen it down there at LMU ever. 
and they had students rocking, blah, blah, blah. And it was cool outside. You know, they were rowdy. They were kind of visceral. And then you get in and then just the air was sucked out of the gym. So it was kind of funny in that sense, too. Um, but our guys were completely focused. We were, you know, we remembered the game where they got us up in Spokane and they came out with a, you know, better energy. But I thought the defensive plan on Cam Shelton really set the tone. Yeah, Gonzaga's defense, I think, uh, didn't get the credit um, as compared to the offense. But that's hard when you score 68 points and a half. Everyone's going to focus on the offense um, because they only scored 67 the whole entire game up here in Spokane. Um, but the defense did shut mid pick and rolls out. They were active in help side. And then they were able with that defense to get out and transition with numbers. So I, I agree with, with those observations. They were spot on. When you look at going from a dominant performance like that to then two days later having to play a team in, in Pepperdine that you've dominated literally, I think, won 45 straight against something ridiculous like that, there can be a natural letdown, and it's subconscious many times. I, I thought I saw a little bit of that in the Pepperdine game, but I also saw a Pepperdine team that's unbelievably talented. They just can't put things together. Yeah, I, I totally agree. The Pepperdine game is always dangerous. Um, you know, they're two and eleven in conference. Um, but if you look at their their lineup and their roster, and you're like, holy smokes! I mean, the Lewis kid is a bona fide NBA player. There's no question in my mind that he's going to, you know, at least have a chance to play in the league. He's going to be a first round draft pick. Long, athletic, could score. He's not as erratic as he was last year. Quick twitch. I watched him shoot before the game. I was sizing him up. It's like, yeah, he's legit six seven. Um, strong. And then the Porter kid, who's a great freshman, had 20 down there, you know, 6'11". He's got the pedigree, the Porter brothers. Um, and then I think he's had some uh, other siblings that played Division One basketball. He's a pro prospect. Houston Millett is a, is a fantastic scoring guard, you know, kind of like Colby Ross was for them where, you know, he can facilitate, but there'd be nights where he can get 30. So you sit there and go, this is honestly a dangerous game for anybody. And every time we play up there, we're never like we can never separate from them. And it was yeah. completely the case up there. I mean, we were it was a one point game with three minutes to go. And like we were in control. But you look up, you're like, hey, man, we're going to have to, you know, make some plays and go win this. But it wasn't like we were playing soft and lazy. You get what I'm saying? They were making shots. Yeah. Uh, Lewis was playing great. Then obviously Porter was, I think, eight for 12 from the field. He hit a couple that were like, whoa. Um, same with Houston Millette. Um, you know, the story of that team uh, just the other night, there was, I think, 13 NBA scouts there. That tells you how talented. It's not just to look at Gonzaga players. They yeah. came to watch Pepperdine, how they're going to play against Gonzaga, right? You know what I'm saying? So um, that team is just – it always baffles my mind a little bit of how much talent they have, and, and sometimes they just can't put it together, like you said. Well, I don't think they're going to be able to – to advance deep enough into the WCC tournament to face Gonzaga, but that would be an interesting third matchup. Um, you know, I think that third game when you see teams play against each other in a season, you kind of see which coaches make the best adjustments and then which players you can just throw adjustments out the window that just go make plays. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the season in college or at the end of the season in the NBA, it's all about making plays. And I think the thing I, that, that I've really learned about Gonzaga this year is they've got a number of guys now that are just comfortable making plays. We know Drew Timmy's been that. Julian Strother has really impressed me over the last month. Uh, and then you've got other guys that have stepped up. Nolan Hickman made a big shot. Roger Bolton's had a couple big ones. Hunter Salas has made a couple big ones. So I think there's plenty of guys on this roster that are, aren't are afraid of the moment right now um, going into March. Do you see something similar? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think you got to have guys, especially on the perimeter, to kind of go get a bucket or at least a really good shot. Because, um, every you know, especially in conference, everybody knows what you run and everybody knows your counters by this time. Um, so I think Julian's done a good job of that lately, of just going to get buckets instead of always – you know, kickouts or running an action, he's starting to drive and make that floater and counter and then getting his three-point shot off. Um, and then Rashears had big moments. So, yeah, you need it definitely on the perimeter late in the season. Um, but that that Pepperdine game is just a weird matchup for us because they play the similar style of, hey, let's get up and down and let it rip. And they start to get going. And, and we don't want to slow the game down because that's how we play. But also they're super talented. 
So tonight's game, USD, the Toreros, the new and interesting hire, Steve Lavin. I think he's a good coach. Uh, he's been at UCLA, St. John's, but uh, he's been in the broadcast world for the last few years. Uh, I had a chance to talk with him earlier today, and he's learned a lot and changed a lot of philosophies from his previous coaching stints. This USD team plays as fast as anybody in the country. I mean, they are uh, first in the WCC in fast break points, top 12, I think, in the country, fast break points. What do you expect to see from USD tonight against Gonzaga? I, I think exactly how you described, just up and down, trying to outscore us. Uh, you know, they have really nothing to lose in this game. We've only played them once because they finished last uh, last season. So, uh, you know, for him, it could be, a you know, a, a catalyst to – you know, if he gets a win to help recruiting for the program to get it back to, you know, some prominence or some, uh, you know, being relative in the West Coast Conference. So I think they're just going to play quick and get up and down. And hopefully our guys are not, uh, you know, looking ahead to the big matchup against St. Mary's on Saturday. Yeah, that big matchup uh, is going to be a lot of fun. You and I will chat about that in our next release of the uh, Gonzaga Nation SI podcast. But uh, last thing, let's touch on really quick before we wrap this one up. Um, postseason awards will be announced by the WCC. Usually they come out about two days after the last regular season games before the conference tournament begins. So uh, I figured you and I could get ahead of it. Um, player of the year, newcomer of the year, and coach of the year. You tell me if you want me to go first or do you want to go first with your picks? Uh, so I think I'll go first. I think player of the year, I think Cam Shelton is really, uh, you know, been fantastic for LMU, not just because he had a great game against Gonzaga, but he's had some 31, 36. Um, you know, they've elevated that program, um, you know, to playing really good basketball. First program to win uh, since BYU's been in the conference to beat Gonzaga, uh, St. Mary's, and BYU in one season. Um, so I think he's, uh, you know, the MVP of the league. Obviously, Drew Timmy's very close. Um, you could argue some other guys, Mahaney maybe. Obviously, Mahaney's newcomer of the year. That's no question. That's He's gonna, probably going to be first team all WCC or at least second team, but he's for sure the freshman of the year, newcomer of the year. And then, you know, for coach of the year, it really you could go with Stan Johnson, I think, but I think we got to give credit to Randy Bennett. Um, year in and year out, he has, you know, teams that overachieve, and that's not a knock, but if you look at the personnel compared to some other teams, uh, they, they always play the most sound basketball with – the least athletic guys. And I mean that in the nicest way, but like just mm -hmm. talent wise, um, they always figure out a way to play good sound basketball. They're always top, you know, 20 in defense. They're efficient. Um, so I like Randy Bennett this year, obviously coach few is always in that category, but I think Randy's got those guys playing kind of above uh, what they were expected. Yeah, no, uh, you, you surprised me a little bit on a player year with Cam Shelton and, you know, the way you described it. And then I quickly go back and think through some of the, the, the numbers that he's put up. That's, that's a legitimate pick for me with them finishing fourth. I, I couldn't go there. So I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to take the easy route and I'm going to go drew Timmy. Um, you know, I think uh, he's going to win that. I don't, I don't think there's anybody on St. Mary's that could legitimately be player of the year. Um, you know, based off of everything we've known now. Mahaney, St. Mary's, as you said, easy newcomer of the year pick. And uh, I'm also going to go with coach of the year being Randy Bennett. I mean, I think that program is still to this day undervalued on the West Coast. And I think they're very undervalued nationally. Uh, I think Gonzaga, you know, they've cleaned up some of their perceived issues or flaws. At least those are perceived from outsiders looking in. So I think Gonzaga could make another Sweet 16 run, but I say that because I think this could be the year the St. Mary's makes it to the Sweet 16. I think they guard that well, um, and they've got just enough shooters and creativity with the ball with Mahaney um, that they're going to surprise some people. Totally agree. Well, there you have it, Gonzaga Nation SI with another episode with Adam Morrison and myself, Dan Dick. I will be back in a couple days talking about all things St. Mary's. Perfect. Uh, I'll just jump right into this one and we can just go. Um, yep. <clears throat> uh, probably 10 minutes ish, I'm thinking. Yeah. So. Gonzaga Nation SI, I'm Dan Dickow, one of your two hosts alongside Adam Morrison. Yes, that Adam Morrison, National Player of the Year from Mead High School. Mo, 
hard to believe regular season ends against St. Mary's. Whoever comes up with the, the scheduling is pretty darn smart by putting this game at the end of the year, just like this, where it determines the, the, the league championship. Yeah, it, it's worked out perfect for the West Coast Conference. Obviously, hopefully we've uh, held serve against San, as San Diego, but that's uh, pretty much a foregone conclusion. Um, it's perfect for the league. It's perfect for San Diego, or excuse me, for St. Mary's to get an opportunity to play on college game day. Obviously, it benefits us. Um, so, yeah, whoever did the scheduling had a crystal ball, and they, they, you know, they picked it perfectly. So I'm really looking forward to the game Saturday. It's going to be, um, you know, a perfect matchup a lot of adjustments. We should have won down there, in my opinion, um, had the game in hand and then my Haney went crazy. Um, but what a great opportunity for not only us, like I said, the league, but also St. Mary's and their guys and, you know, to help elevate their program. Yeah. College game day is a, is a really fun atmosphere to be around. Um, it doesn't always get to the West coast just because there's so much involved with equipment and personnel and uh, talent uh, to, to, put that production on uh i was able to be a part and not a part of it but watch it one time uh when it was held at, at texas a&m i was calling the game on radio um but i was there for kind of watching how it all went down have you been able to be a part of, of college game day or see it up close at all were they there when you played yeah we we did it in uh, the first time it came to gonzaga it was in 2006 um we played stanford kind of an op one of those you know, the years when you could schedule two games inside conference because we had the 14 instead of 16 or whatever, the unbalanced schedule, whatever, how they defined it. Um, so we played Stanford and that was the first year. So it was uh, a lot of chaos, good chaos, but it was a lot of media attention. Um, it's great. Like you said, that they come on the West Coast. There hasn't been a West Coast one yet this year. Um, so it worked out perfectly, you know, like I said, for the elevation for our program and then obviously St. Mary's. But it, it's a it's a massive production. I think it's more fun for the students and the fans than it is the players. Obviously that's not a negative, but there's so much media involved that you kind of look at it as, can we just get this over with and get to the game? <laughs> and, and once you're done with it, you're kind of more relieved, but also, you know, it's, you know, it's a once in a lifetime type of deal because they do little shorts on guys and, and special features that you probably won't get, um, you know, nationally. So it, it's a really cool thing that uh, our guys get to experience it. Yeah, it's it's going to be fun to uh, go back and watch some of the, uh, you know, little packages they put together on individual guys. They do such a good job of telling the stories uh, that aren't always out there. Everybody knows, you know, about Drew Timmy's footwork. A lot of people know about, um, you know, Anton Watson growing up here in Spokane. Um, but they do a really good job with a deep dive of, of different things to to be unique with their storylines. Um, it's against St. Mary's. If Gonzaga wins, it creates a, a an, it extends an 11 year uh, conference title winning streak, at least outright or a share of it. But they have to win. Um, what what are the keys in your mind in looking at this game on Saturday that Gonzaga has to do to get that 11th league title in a row? Well, I think obviously you got to stop Mahaney out out front. Uh, ball screen coverage is going to be paramount. Um, I think we did a really good job against him for most of the game. He started the game one for eight. Part of that was his own nerves. Like if you're just being honest, uh, he was rushing things and you could see the pressure, not that he can't handle it, but he was just trying to do too much too early. So I thought our plan was, wasn't bad. Um, but I think late in the game, he exposed kind of our late shows. We tried to do a couple drop coverages on him, just didn't work. So just like Cam Shell with LMU, I would suspect, suspect that we're going to either blitz or red or some sort of uh, defense to try to get the ball out of his hands. Um, and, but part of that, too, wasn't all, only just the screeners, the guy guarding the screeners. It was our weak side ter uh, help was awful. If you break down that film, which I did right after we watched the game, you know, Anton and Drew were, you know, on the backside a couple of times and missed a couple of tags. They got some layups. So I think just the biggest adjustment is how do we guard ball screens, um, you know, versus Mahaney. And then obviously the kid inside, I think Sexton, he had a fantastic game. He had like 20. Um, we can't allow him, a guy like that, to get 20. So um, we got to make sure that, uh, you know, we obviously eliminate their best player, but we can't let a guy kind of go off and, you know, and, and score out of his normal, you know, production limits. So, 
if we do all those things, uh, I think we should be favored plus being at home. And if you look at the game down there, there we were in control for 33 minutes of it and should I could add a chance at the end if we don't make a defensive mistake down you know down below so um I say all that the plan was decent it's just got to be better out front and you know in the pick and roll coverage that's that's what I think yeah that's uh that's a great scouting report and I agree with that some of the the missed assignments on the weak side being late you know, I, I agree with Mahaney kind of played a little tight early on and then he was spectacular down the stretch. Um, you know, St. Mary's to me, though, is one of those teams that doesn't beat themselves. Gonzaga's going to have to win that game. Um, and that's that's thankfully for Gonzaga. That's been the case late lately this year, at least at USF at BYU. They went out and won those games so they can kind of look back and say, hey, you know, we've had some some stretches where we had guys that had to step up that did step up. So I think that's one thing that, that Gonzaga can have in their back pocket. Now, I think the the listeners that don't realize this is actually it's very interesting and very important um, to understand who gets the number one seed in the conference tournament. So if Gonzaga tie wins, it's a tie for the league. And they're because they've lost to the same teams one time each to LMU and then to each other, the other, it would be, they go to the net for the tiebreaker. It would, doesn't go important differential. And so this could become really interesting where St. Mary's could be seven in the net. Gonzaga could be eight. St. Mary's would be the one seed. The reason I say that is because I learned today that it's based off of as soon as the St. Mary's game is over the net. They don't go to Chicago State because I was thinking there was no way Gonzaga was going to win the net because they're going their net's going to drop once they play Chicago State next week. Um, pretty interesting, I thought. What do you what do you think about that? Yeah, I think uh, I think net raking is is appropriate because I mean if you look if if you're arguing for St. Mary's if there was a tiebreaker with that they probably win 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 point differential right so then you're you're favoring a thing for a certain style, not just wins and losses. So I think net would be the, the fairest option to do because it, you know, encapsulates strength of schedule, you know, the opponents you've beaten, not just out in conference, out of conference, all that thing. So I think the net is fair. And then it's, you know, it's one of those deals. If you get the second seed, you just have to, you know, you have to bring your dark jerseys, you know, that's about <laughs> it. That's about it. You know, like, uh, you know, so um our first round game is going to be tough regardless, right? We're going to have to either play an LMU team that we just killed and they obviously beat us, or we're going to have to play a BYU team that if you're really frank and, and honest, probably should have two wins again. Yeah. Regardless, it's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting to see how this shakes out. I think Gonzaga is going to win. I don't think it matters if they're the home, the one seed or the two seed. I know a lot of fans get wrapped up in that. Uh, I do like the, the buy system all the way into the semifinals. Um, and it's hard to believe March Madness is literally right around the corner. I mean, we're in the final week of the regular season, um, and it, it's there's no better time if you're a college basketball fan, that's for sure. Yep, it's going to be a fun stretch, and hopefully uh, we can put it together. Well, Mo, always good to chat Gonzaga hoops, always good to chat just hoops in general. So uh, until next week, uh, appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you again really soon. Cool, man.